I do feel, and I don't know why, I do feel obligated to say that just before we hit record, we were talking about zit stickers. <laughs> <laughs> We also had a really good conversation about like queer identity and queer history and 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 zit stickers and and acne. I need you all to know that the the conversation in its entirety was kibby body types and clothes. Yes. Gender identity and sexuality and zit stickers and hormonal breakouts and that is not three different conversations. That was one conversation yeah. weaving itself. Yes. <laughs> it was a great conversation to the point where we were supposed to start recording, I think, 25 minutes ago. The frequency that that happens. Yeah. Yeah. We should just start any record as soon as we sit down. But also then people will have to hear us talk about sit stickers, <laughs> <laughs> which are maybe the single best invention after the printing press. I think I can stand by that statement. For I'll sure. stand next to you and say it as well. Um, do you like the ones that are colorful shapes or do you just go with like the clear medical looking like kind of hidden ones? Yeah, I like the clear medical looking kind of hidden ones, but I like the ones that have the extra border around so that they mm -hmm. stick down and, and don't start to peel up. Yeah. Oh, God, that's the worst. I the star ones are really cool, uh, but I feel like. You know when a goose gets color on it and it panics because it's like, oh, no, my camouflage. I'm just a little guy. I, Whenever I have the stars on my face, I feel like my stealth is ruined. Yeah, I don't have enough confidence in my acne to put colorful stickers on it. But when the thing is when other people have them on, I only ever think positively about it. I know. So, like, I should afford that grace to myself, but I, I also choose the clear ones. The frequency that I go outside with them still on my face... Oh, yeah. It's, but, you know, it's not penicillin, everyone. It's not the car or something else that's important. It's the wheel. zit sticker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fire. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that one wasn't invented. That was given to us by Prometheus. So oh, good. right. My bad. bad. Yeah. Zit stickers <laughs> were given to us by, who's the god of zit stickers? It feels like it would be an Athena if we're going Greek pantheon. But you know what? I'm going to give it to Inanna and say thank you, Inanna, for that one. Oh, I like that. Right? That feels like she would do that. I d it does feel Inanna energy. Okay. <laughs> Zit stickers brought to you by Inanna. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rowan Hall. <laughs> and I'm Tracy Harrison. And this is is Willing and Fable, the podcast that brings you original retellings and in-depth research on the history, mystery, and mythology that makes the world so fascinating. Each week, we research a topic from history or mythology, and then we write an original story to go along with that topic. So if you'd like to support the show, think about checking out our Patreon. One of the best benefits, in my opinion, is that you get to join our Discord community, which is so active and so fun and filled with memes, and specifically for me, pictures of bats. <laughs> I love it when everyone shows up with bats for you. Me too. It always makes my day. Tracy's inbox is so flooded with bats from me across so many different social media platforms. Oh, you know who the, I've, I've said this before, the top two people who consistently send me the cutest bat things are you and your mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Also, if you want to support the show, you can send Tracy Bat Pictures or you can head to our website, check out our recommendations page, check out our merch, just check out pictures of us. I don't know. Click it. It's shockingly helpful, uh, that SEO. And Tracy made it really pretty for us. So, Oh, thank you. I love our website. It was really fun to work on. Or... <laughs> Another way you can support the show is by putting on your favorite over-the-top fancy outfit and going to your local grocery store and picking up yourself a little treat. You've worked hard and you deserve it. But no matter what you do, we're just happy to join you on this episode. I need everyone to know I wrote that for Tracy because I needed a little treat. <laughs> the problem for me is that now every day... I need a little treat to get through the day. Like, it's no longer a rare, let me give myself a little treat because this whole week has been whatever. It's like every day. I need my daily little treat. So a friend of mine found out that I like Evian. Mm. And when I go on, when I travel, 
I always buy Evian. I splurge on the nice water. Yeah. If I'm going to be buying a water bottle and I'm away, I get Evian. Uh, and they found out that I like Evian. So now they just get me Evian as a little treat. <laughs> Oh, my God. But now we call it good girl water. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <gasps> good girl it's, water. It's a little good girl. <laughs> you know what mine is for that is Voss. Because sometimes oh. at work we'll have, like, free food and drinks for big meetings. And every once in a while they'll splurge and they'll have a few Voss water bottles mm -hmm. out. And we're all like, what are we, kings? And we all flood to them and, like, take as many as we can. I love Voss. And when you can get them in the glass bottles. Oh, I mean, it's genuinely i sit there and i'm like am i a king what is this it's good girl water i'm telling you call your water whatever you're drinking people out there good girl water good boy water you'll feel really accomplished getting it you'll maybe want to drink it more yes you don't have to do heavy on <laughs> <laughs> it tastes the most like the water at home to me mm. i don't typically buy different types of bottled water for like the way they taste it's genuinely just like how bougie do i feel am i a good girl <laughs> am i <laughs> living like a king because sometimes i'm in the mood for a square fiji bottle for no reason <laughs> it's the shape not the, the brand shape. not the flavor yeah. mm, okay can i justify it no do i sometimes just go yeah this is the move today other days it's a smart water because it's the smart choice or something. Yeah, because I feel like it's, you know, I'm look at me, I'm being healthy. It's got pH balance, which means nothing, by the way, everyone. Your pH balance of your body cannot move in a way that is impactful without you physically getting ill from it. So just buy the water you want. Don't worry if it's pH balanced. That is just a sales gimmick. Yeah, it's so much malarkey. I've had, I've had a sickness where they had to measure my pH and it was relevant and that's it. Yeah, there's a great Sawbones episode about it. Check it out. So really, just to stop myself from continuing to list off brand name water that has nothing to do with our show, <laughs> <laughs> this is the last of our little four-part series storytime episodes where Tracy and I took an excuse to look back at a hundred episodes of Willing and Fable and compile some stories we enjoyed, we thought about a lot, thought went together and present them just as the fiction because folks ask us for that a, a bit. Yeah, people really love that aspect of our show. And so it was really fun for us to get to, to think through what have we really loved? What haven't we loved? What stories go together? What are the themes? And so we broke it up into these four episodes and it's been really fun and really eye-opening for us to explore. Yeah, part of the fun was looking at work we haven't looked at it for a very long time. I you and I talked about this early in this series, but you know, we we consume the episodes we've recently made because that's part of making them. Mm -hmm. And it's important to consume your own work, but by episode 100, it's been a minute since we visited episode 20. Yes. And separating out the fictional works also framed them really differently in my brain looking at your work now with a, a different thoughtful eye reframed it for me it was fun it was fun yeah so today we're doing some queer icons from our three seasons of history mystery and mythology we're presenting tracy's writing on ann lister my story from Samson and Delilah, we're covering Inanna mm -hmm. and Achilles and Patroclus. And these stories are all so different. Yes, it was really hard to pick the stories we wanted to talk about in this episode. We had a long list that we had to narrow down based on what we really enjoyed having written, what we thought went together. And I'm really pleased with the four that we came out with, but it just makes me more and more excited for the seasons that we're going to do in the future to keep collecting those stories and sharing them with the world. These stories are so important and and also they allow us to be creative. Yes, that's true. I listened to these episodes and I just think about all of the history that I was taught that doesn't ever mention the queer community ever. No. And it's so wild hearing the public discourse now and saying, well, you know, this law in XYZ state... 
actually prohibits you from talking about Martha Washington because she's Washington's wife. Like, are we re are we really going to chase this down? Are we really going to say you can't talk about relationships just so we can be homophobic? And right. it would have been such a benefit to so many of us, so many people to just hear the wide variety of ways that people live and tell stories and love and explore history, mystery, mythology, you know, <laughs> like the fiction and the history are yeah. so deeply in, intertwined in this case that it's. <sighs> well, and the implication that anything queer is unsafe for children <sighs> is, is so deeply frustrating. Um, there is the obviously the law that was just passed in Tennessee where yeah. drag queens are not allowed to perform in public. But and the KKK can have a, a rally. Of course. It's, you know, free speech. It's, it, it's horrifying. It's horrible. And, and we obviously don't have time to dive into it deeply today. But while we're here and talking about queer people and the, the benefit they can have, everyone needs to go check out Mama G on TikTok, Instagram. Um, she's a, a UK-based drag queen who goes to libraries. And uh, her drag name is based on Mother oh, Goose. I love her content. <laughs> yes. Um, we need more of that. You know, drag is this wide net. It, it's a drag queen named Benjela Creme uh, said it in an interview. Drag is a wide net and you can have things that are pushing the boundaries of what society is comfortable with. And then you can have people like Mama G who read to children in libraries, which is something that is powerful and needed. Yeah, I remember seeing someone comment on one of Mama G's videos that their kid thought that they were a princess because it yeah. was... It was just like so much beautiful over the top femininity that they were like, oh, well, this is just a princess reading to me, which is like the the childhood dream. Oh, my God. Of course. Kids believe in literal magic and, and the most insane unreality we, we present to them. Why is a drag queen not just a beautiful princess? So so obviously on this show, we're very, um, very pro drag queen and really pro anything in the queer community and <laughs> we and exist we, just, we exist <laughs> and um that, that's kind of the theme of today's episode is is bringing light to those stories because it's it is not done enough so do you want to start us off with our first story so our first story is about ann lister this is from episode 32, and for those who might not remember, Anne Lister was a woman from the 1800s who famously was known as Gentleman Jack because she was known to seduce the wives of all the people uh, around her, and she was an out and proud lesbian who married a woman named Anne Walker and very intentionally chose a high-profile wife. And the reason we know all of this is because her diaries were found and decoded hundreds of years after her death in her family home. And we have access to her most intimate thoughts and feelings and ideas from her life. Imagine being such the main character that you keep a diary in code. She was. Like, she was. She, she was that main character, you know? It's real Julie Dobney energy. Yes. <laughs> that was a great episode because we covered them in the same episode. Yeah. And probably that's why she's on my mind. <laughs> So, without further ado, without further ado, here are some letters from Anne Lister. August 8th, 1806. It was, I remember, raining quite terribly on the day that I was politely asked to leave the boarding school. It wasn't even a remotely interesting straw that broke the camel's back. All I'd been doing was showing another girl a particularly amusing sketch I'd done earlier in the day. It was a small drawing of our teacher. Not even a body one, just a drawing of her scrunched up, angry little face as she spoke. Well, I put pencil to paper and that was that. Goodbye boarding school. Goodbye sloping attic room with that tiny, stubborn little window. And goodbye, Eliza. That last one was the only loss that even approached something resembling a sting. She was the first girl I ever kissed. She was the first of many things in my life. First kiss, first touch, first love, and first loss. Before I met Eliza, I was so certain that something about me was wrong. But when my lips met hers for the first time, I realized that Everything about me was just right. I was made to be exactly as I am. 
She looked at me as though I were a god. Aphrodite, or perhaps Athena herself, lying next to her in that bed. When I walked away from the boarding school and the rain beat down upon my shoulders, I realized that it was the look in her eyes that I would miss most of all. Eliza herself was suitable. I'd enjoyed her company well enough, but the realizations that she awoke in me were what I would miss most of all. It wasn't the sounds of her laughter or the feeling of her hands or even the words she spoke that I would miss. It was the intoxicating, all-encompassing power that she bestowed upon me that I would long for in her absence. I'd spent many years searching for that power again. May 18th, 1819. Paris, as it turns out, was much noisier than I expected. In the whole of the city, there were only a few places which were truly solitary. My favorite of these, aside from the university library, which housed a sizable collection of ancient Greek works, was the lecture hall. Though I spent hours there surrounded on either side by sweaty men with perfectly trimmed sideburns, I was truly alone. I mean that in the best possible sense of the word. Though they stared at me openly as though I were more interesting than the anatomy on display, I ignored them with ease. They were fools, all of them, if they could not see the wealth of information before them in the form of the slightly bloated corpse. She was magnificent, all bones and sinew and muscle and so very human. So alive in her death was she to me that I could focus on no other. So it was with genuine enthusiasm that I agreed to assist the professor in his dissection. All the men stared in horror as I, a woman, took the scalpel in my hand and ran it along the skin with ease. I saw no reason to be squeamish. The woman before me felt no pain, and this was finally my opportunity to learn. Why would I waste that time feeling anything but excitement? I traced the blade below her blue-tinged bottom lip and thought briefly of Mariana. The curve of their mouths was so similar that for a moment I hesitated in my actions. The Professor Mistaking my hesitation for disgust, tried to gently take the scalpel from my hand. But I pulled away, refusing to lose this opportunity over a woman I had not seen nor spoken to in over a year. A woman who betrayed my very soul the day she walked down that aisle. Mariana Belcom was nothing to me now, no more alive in my life or in my mind than the swollen corpse before me. My heart died in my chest the day that she took her wedding vows. Watching her sell herself to that man, a man who cared for her no more than he did his prized cow, caused the final coating of ice to freeze over my already frigid heart. I would not love again. I could not. Not while the memory of our time together lived in my mind and blocked out anyone else from getting near me like I was in a gilded cage. If I could not have her, then I would have another. But I would not marry just for love, and I would never, ever, as she did, sell myself to a man. I would have myself a wife. Though, just as any man would be expected to, I would not just have any woman. My wife would need to be a woman of wealth, means, and status. I decided right then in that lecture hall with a scalpel in my hand that I would be no different than any other man in that room. I would be calculating. I would be smart. I would be a businesswoman. And I would have myself a wife by my side. I found that the blade cut more easily after that. October 20th, 1832 Anne Walker seems to be warming to my advances. Though ever still a shy and quiet girl, she looks upon me with a growing warmth in her eyes. She admitted to me just the other day that she'd taken notice of me when we'd first met nearly ten years before. She'd had hopes ever since that day that the two of us should meet again. Her hands played with the lace at her sleeves, and all I could think was how much I wanted to take those hands in mine and press my lips to the fingers. 
They were always cold, Miss Walker's hands. She said she appreciated the warmth of mine wrapped around them as it helped relieve the ever-present chill in her. I wanted her to know that I knew many other ways to warm her, body and soul, but I was aware that delicate steps needed to be taken with such a flighty bird. So I smiled and told her that when I had returned to Shibden Hall and discovered that she was near, it filled my heart with warmth to know we could be friends. She insisted then with enthusiasm that we were indeed friends. In fact, she admitted that I was the closest friend she'd ever had. More dear to her than anyone else had ever been. It was at that moment I knew that Anne Walker would be my wife. If it took me years from now or just another day, I was completely certain that she would be standing by my side as my bride one day. She was sweet and lovely, kind and demure, and most importantly, wealthy and connected. As I watched the autumn sunlight fall across the fabric of her pale pink gown, I felt an undeniable truth come to life inside of me. Sitting before me, hands delicately folded in her lap, was the woman I would one day marry. Unbeknownst to Miss Walker at the time, that was the moment she became my wife. We talked about this in your last episode where you covered women in history. Is a letter from a historical figure a Tracy Hallmark? 100% <laughs> it is. It you is. did it. You did what I love, which is put us in that person's shoes or someone in their lives, kind of really enmesh us in that world. Mm -hmm. Do you remember those books that were in our elementary school library that were like, remember, ba -ba 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 -ba, the person's name, and it's a diary? The, I Okay, yes. And I read every single princess one that they had. The only one I remember was because I did a project on it as a kid. It was Remember Patience Whipple, which is like a pilgrim one. Mm -hmm. I Listen, I don't know how these books would hold up now, y'all. Um, but they were essentially books where you just get to pretend you're the person in oh, the yeah. world. Oh, yeah. I think it was Mary Tudor, maybe, that I read. But I definitely read the Cleopatra one. You know, obviously, I read oh, that one. Oh, of course. <laughs> I loved those as a kid. And I think it shows. Um, and like yes. I said in the, in the last episode, <laughs> the reason that I love writing letters or diary entries from historical figures is because it gives me a chance to honor their real lived experiences while still getting to flex those creative writing muscles. Mm -hmm. And it also honors that love I have of historical fiction and those <laughs> books that I read as a kid. I, if I walked into that library and it were laid out the same way, I could go immediately to the shelf where they would be. Also the ghost section. Yes. I know exactly where the ghost section is and I know exactly where the ancient Egypt section is on the front if you go through the main door oh, to the yeah. left. Oh, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're building our <laughs> mind palace, everyone. <laughs> when we get our own mansion, we're going to lay it out like our elementary school library. Where it's going to have its own library and that will be laid out the same way. That's so charming. <laughs> So my question for you, if you can remember mm -hmm. writing this, you wrote from her perspective at different ages. When you did that, was that something that you had to s seek out specific research to support that desire? Or by the time you'd done the research, you felt equipped to kind of travel through her life? The second one, absolutely. I did all the research first and then thought, okay, now that I know who she is, I know her life what stories do I want to tell? And that's where I struggled. I was, I was thinking there were so many moments in her life that are important or are, are hallmarks to the person that she became. And that's where the idea of choosing to write those diary entries came from. So it was easy then to take what I had researched and turn it into fictional writing. But what I really wanted to do was take small moments and make them define her hmm. instead of write the biggest moments like her wedding to Anne or actively getting kicked out of boarding school or you know those huge profound moments I think they absolutely power who she is but I think it's the reflection upon them because she was so introspective that to me was more interesting to explore so I wanted to capture the heartache and the way her heart seemed to harden over time by her mm. own admission and she became more callous but underneath it all was still so deeply feeling 
It's always the little things it's that impact us the most. All of, not all of them, some of my happiest memories are the tiniest little details. Yeah. And they can make or break you because you're not mentally or physically prepared the same way. I also think about this with the things people have said that hurt me. They're often accidental or small, and they just get in your brain sometimes. Like, I think about someone in our high school told me I had short eyelashes. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I really had a crush on that person. And so I, every morning when I put on mascara, still think about that, even though, like, I don't have feelings about that person or my eyelashes, but it it stuck because yeah. it, your brain just does that. It does. And I spent a lot of time and a lot of therapy working through how to either not care what those comments are or what they, you know, what they mean or accept them as truth. You know, I've had people make comments about certain things that I'm deeply insecure about and I can't change the facts of my body or whatever it is that they're commenting on. So it's either fight it or learn to love it. We were actually just talking about this before recording. I have mm -hmm. a very distinct nose. <laughs> it comes nose. from my Italian side. And growing up, I desperately wanted one of those cute little button noses. It was all I wanted for so long. And now I wouldn't trade my nose for anything. I love my big old crooked giant nose. I, it's part of who I am. And I wouldn't be me without it. The best part of growing up is loving the things that you were self-conscious about as a kid. Yeah. Oh, it's the best. Yeah. So I, I've worked really hard to move past the little comments because my brain does the same thing. It wants to hold on to them. It wants to poke me in the brain at <laughs> two in the morning and wake me up and go, hey, remember that thing that someone said and they didn't mean anything by it? You're going to take it really personally. And like, that's not on them. No. Like, that's on me and my reaction. And so um, I completely understand. And it, it's the small moments for sure. You're washing your hair in the shower and all of a sudden bent over double because you didn't say that one thing and that fight in first grade. <laughs> <sighs> yes. <laughs> the way that you had Ann Lister talk about the body mm -hmm. in these letters reminds me so much of the body that I had in my story for The Unknown Woman of the Sun Part One, because they both deal with corpses of women in this very deeply human way. The, I would not have thought to link those stories, you and I kind of exploring that topic in a similar vein, if we hadn't gone back and listened to I this. completely agree. It was one of the first things I thought about when I was re-listening to this story. And I wonder if if that was just a coincidence of our connection or mm -hmm. if, if there was, you know, something sticking in there. But the the idea of loving a woman so reverently, even in death, is the sort of the connecting thread. There's this attention to detail in these two people observing these bodies that feels almost erotic. It is so intimate, but it's yes. not sexual. Yes. And so often we, in modern times, remove ourselves from the daily goings on of being a body, like, just even like body hair and sweat mm -hmm. and this and that. And it's interesting. I was just talking the other day. Uh, I go to this European style spa sometimes uh, where it has the women's and the men's and, mm -hmm. you know, there are baths and people can just walk around nude or in a bathing suit. And I was explaining to a friend, I'm shocked to find that just being around people being bodies makes me feel so much better about being a body. And I, it's, I'm not acknowledging anyone. None of us are really perceiving each right. other. We're just kind of passing like ships in the night. But it removes the shame. It removes the, st the stigma because a lot of the, what we do in our society is say, especially as women, you have to hide your body because it's shameful to have one. Right. And I think perhaps in countries where there are more nude beaches and things like that, it's just naturally baked in. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I am only presented with women who look fundamentally one way on the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just been such a fascinating revelation. And I, I 
feel that in both of those stories. And I'm going to take that as a tie into our next story, the idea of bodies and their impact on Ooh, you. nicely done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rowan, why don't you take it away? So this is from episode 48. I covered the story of Samson and Delilah, which is... I always jokingly say it's the kinkiest story in the Bible. Yes. Which is maybe the broadest oversimplification, but there is a sexuality in this story that is so often diminished and makes the story so much better. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's really a story about tying someone you love up and having an erotic relationship and what it means to be great and how that affects your personal life. There's so many details, but I had the opportunity to be really creative with this mm-hmm. story. And so I, I loved going back to see it. If you've ever fucked around with kitchen scissors and bleach and box dye, you know exactly the scene I'm about to describe to you. Just a mess. Everything that I thought should be contained was flying around the room in splatters and scraps and color and paper and old towels and flecks of hair. And we kept nervously laughing in a way that made my sides ache, and I was drinking this long, cold tea that made my lips pucker. Are you ready? I looked down at Sam, sitting on the toilet lid. He was staring in the mirror, still as a statue. His long, brown hair was hanging like a glossy curtain down his back, and I could tell that the touch of it on his neck was making him itch in this awful, internal way that only those things that violate our entire fucking identity really can. He was wearing this baggy shirt that obscured the hourglass curves with which I was intimately familiar, and after a year's worth of growing, his eyebrows had finally connected in this thick, masculine swoop that framed his frustration. I could tell he was definitely not ready. So I took the scissors to my own hair. They were those shitty, orange-handled desktop monstrosities that had absolutely no right to come near a single follicle. But it's what we had in the apartment, and they just looked brutal. You know, not the instruments of training or skill, just... The tools of an exorcism, I guess. My bangs needed to trim anyway, so I leaned over the sink and started tackling the choppy sort of hack job hair I'd been rocking for almost a year. It was one of the parts about me that Sam's parents least liked to see. And I started us nervously laughing again while I did an impression of Sam's dull father. Braid my hair. Sam's voice was as low as I'd ever heard it the quiet intimacy that echoed in the small room. Truth be told, I'd not really touched his hair much. It was normally in this messy man bun that felt like a bright yellow yield sign as far as physical touch went, so I kept my hands occupied elsewhere most days. But we both looked at each other with this excited, manic expression that only comes when it's 2 a.m. and you have to cut off your own hair or else the world is going to swallow you up. We were whispering now. I was combing out those long lengths into the most neat, perfect braid I could possibly manage, and Sam was (laughs) tying himself up in knots. Like, literally tying himself. He'd done this trick with his sweatshirt sleeves that made his arms disappear into kind of a homemade the harness jacket of fleece and panic. Are you okay? Sam kind of grinned. Not yet. I was holding his braid in my hands, and the scissors were wide open to saw through those 20 years of middle part, straight down the back, suburban girl lengths of hair. He just gave me the slightest nod. It was barely a movement. And then I fucking hacked that shit off. I held that braid up for Sam like a sacrifice to whatever god was available for a late night offering. We collapsed on the floor in this pile of whispering and giggling, snotty, teary kissing. And I don't know what it was. We were grown-ass adults, but something about it felt like sneaking out at a sleepover, secretly piercing your ears at summer camp. 
Wait, 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 wait. Let me clean up the back. I pushed him off me and back to where I could finish cutting. Now, I'm not saying I'm a savant, but what I did with those scissors and clippers was frankly groundbreaking. An at-home haircut so legendary that mere mortals will tell the story of my triumph for decades to come. No kidding, I could have a career as a barber tomorrow. I transform the men into men, baby. I am merely the hand that did the shearing, but oh, what skill that hand has. And the whole time I'm working my magic, figuring out how to use clippers and, like, know when bleach develops or whatever. And Sam is just looking at me in the mirror, untying himself and saying my name every so often in surprise. He'd tilt his head to a new angle and say, Delilah, in this shocked, blissful whisper. Delilah. Looking back, I think that's the most sensual way he'd ever said my name. Delilah. The whole time I was cutting and dying, Sam was just... untying himself. (laughs) The hoodie somehow became unwrapped, and he picked up that long, sleek braid, and he kept rubbing tears out of his eyes like he'd never seen his own face before just kind of stumbling around blind, although he was sitting in the bathroom with me the whole time. Sam looked smaller, somehow. Not weak, but like like the little kid version of himself. Not the adult one that had been running around for years trying to protect all his sweet, soft feelings, and Not the Sam who'd had a thousand everyday people parrot some bullshit about, like, God's will and whatever convenient manipulation sold more misery. It's just this small, simple grace that was at the core of him that existed before the naming of things. So he would say, Delilah. And I knew he was thinking about the next time we'd see his parents, or, like, hell, the first time he just walked out the damn door. If they would recognize or rebuke him or imply that this always truth that they now had to see was a change that they could grow back. I just kept working. And I would say, Sam? And we just kept up these little private prayers until I finally finished rinsing the dye from his hair in the sink. It was blue. Bright, rich, shocking blue. Again, I must have done okay, because that boy just looked... mm. (laughs) He looked like himself. Hey, Sam. I couldn't stop smiling. Samson, he said, for the first time. Hey, Samson, I said. Hey, Delilah. You know the feeling of freshly buzzed hair. It's soft to touch, and it's soft to be touched. I stayed up that whole night just running my hands over the back of that boy's neck. He teased me that it itched, but I knew by the way he fell asleep that it didn't. Not really. Not in that same internal way his hair had itched before. (laughs) Everything was still a mess. It was too late now to start any cleaning, but... It kind of felt non-messy in the bed that night. I felt the calm of his breathing and the way his body relaxed, and I just thought, God damn, he's the strongest man I know. Please just let this make things a little easier. Let him be as weak as every other man every once in a while. I knew that starting tomorrow, anyone who saw his hair would give me credit, which is cool, I guess. I didn't do too bad with the trimming. But it really wasn't me that did the hard stuff. This was all Samson's story. And it's not really about a fucking haircut. 
When I was re-listening to this story in preparation for this episode, I was taking Malcolm on a walk and Aww. I actually had to stop in my walk for a second because I was just so blown away by the emotions I felt re-listening to this story. This is so intensely real and that's my favorite part about it. Yeah, this this story as a way of exploring gender was something that I was not prepared to really love as much as I did. The idea that this woman cutting this man's hair and taking away his, quote, power, but it actually being a symbol of transformation that is so needed just feels so much more true to me, mm -hmm. to my my experience as a human <laughs> and having people explore gender in the bible is great um when <laughs> we are in america I and mean, again tracy and i went to a school that was across the street from a catholic mega church mm -hmm. um there is a lot of evidence to suggest that uh in the hebrew bible there was discussion of many genders absolutely and so this story feels in line with that to me. I I just loved it being just so chill and normal. And like, we've all had that moment where you have to cut your hair in the middle of the night. Or I, yes. I have. Oh, I have. Oh my God. The amount of hair colors and cuts I've had. Oh, that was one of my favorite parts of this was your description of just being in a too small bathroom in, in your first apartment or mm -hmm. your college apartment or, or, you know, some place that's new and sacred to you, even if it's shitty and old and loving that it's yours and being with the people that make you feel safe and doing something that feels true to you, even if it feels like a rebellion to the world. Mm. There are so many tiny, tiny details in this story that it was why I had to stop where I was like, I, I know these people. I know these two people. Yeah. They're real humans to me. And and it was so beautiful. And then the twist of the haircut actually giving Samson his strength was beautiful. Thank you. It was really fun dropping those Easter eggs in all the way through. I think you you hit the nail on the head. I hadn't actually really kind of absorbed that until you said it, but I'm so interested in spaces that are personally sacred that seem like they shouldn't be. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we've got churches and uh, all sorts of standing stones and mosques and temples and places that we uh, collectively all went, this is sacred. But yeah. in my new apartment, my <laughs> my little reading quarter is sacred. The, mm -hmm. the little area where I can just curl up with my book and the light is perfect and I can put on the candles. That feels sacred to me. Even though, you know, it's a, an apartment that was built in the 70s. It's yeah. like shabby and needs a repair. And it's just it's so much more, I don't know, what's the word? It's not like godly. It's not like holy. It's like it just feels so larger than life. Yeah, it's a combination of feeling like the space is both sacred. And then in order for it to feel that way for me, it also has to feel like a home. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, there has to be a level of safety and a level of need for it. Hmm. Well said. Well, thank you. <laughs> this was an amazing story. I mean, we could just keep talking and talking and talking about it. It's a rare, happy Rowan story. <laughs> <laughs> they're not that rare. No, they're not that rare. But this one, this one was, and, and this is funny, I've, I've had a few friends, we've talked about this, a word for a story that has a lot of emotion in it, but that doesn't mean that it's sad. Hmm. Um, and I haven't found the right word for that because like emotional isn't quite the right thing. Yeah, it's but great, but not Alexander the. I, I totally <laughs> get where you're going. <laughs> I need to tell you, I told that joke mm -hmm. the same day you told it to me as if it were my own. Oh my God, that's so funny. And then How, immediately- what, what was the reaction? uproarious laughter of course good. Okay, truly good. and then immediately after i was like i know tracy would be fine with it but i'm gonna tell everyone <laughs> that this is from tracy <laughs> i appreciate the credit but i don't need it 
but I didn't do it until after. So yeah, good. Well, it's not going to hit the same if you're like, okay, so my friends had a funny joke and I'm going to repeat. You just got to, you got to get it right out with, with the quick hit. One, two, Alexander the. <laughs> Great, but not Alexander the. <laughs> okay, so now our goddess of zit stickers. Mm-hmm. I can't believe <laughs> Okay, so we're moving on to episode 67, which was about Inanna, the uh, ancient Sumerian goddess of love and war. And I really loved getting to do this episode because exploring her and the nuances of her and the priests who worshipped her known as gala priests, which uh, were men who acted and spoke and kind of lived as women, was so eye-opening to the idea that we think, and you know, you'll hear a lot of people say, there's been a gender binary forever. It's always been men and women. And that is so not true. And in so many cultures, they've accepted wider ideas of what gender is. And this is one of them. So I uh, had a really fun time writing this story of what does Anana look like now? What does a goddess look like thousands of years after she had her heyday, thousands of years after her birth? I'm so glad that you pitched this to be in this episode because so far we've got so many different ways of being queer mm-hmm. and so many different focuses. Like Anne Lister is very much about how this person operates in a constrained society, how they feel empowered. Samson and Delilah is this personal love and transformation. Mm-hmm. Inanna is this identity exploration. It, it's such a queerness is such a broad umbrella that to have a variety of stories instead of just love stories, mm-hmm. I think was really important to me, and I think you captured it here. Yeah. All right, let's jump into the story. You walked into the museum, echoed by the sound of your shoes clack, clack, clacking across the marble floor of the entryway. The lobby was a large and grand room, opulent in the way that only museums and opera houses seem to be anymore. There were wide stone columns around the edges of the circular room that reached with outstretched hands towards the sunroof, with bright sunlight streaming into the chamber through the wide floor-to-ceiling windows, the whole space felt light and airy, yet still imposing. You always appreciated that about this space. You walked towards the service desk, tucked away at the left side of the room, You didn't need anything, but there was a young man working there you hadn't seen before. He sat next to a woman you'd seen here many times before. Her sleek black hair was always tied back into a tight, neat bun at the back of her head, and her eyes were lined with thick, dark liner. The young man, however, was all fresh-faced and freckled, and he sat up straighter as you approached. They always did. There was something in your air, even now, that made everyone slightly uneasy around you. Sometimes it was the good kind of uneasy, like the flutterings in your stomach after a first date. Other times it was the sort of uneasiness that sat heavy in your gut and didn't leave you for hours. Based on the red flush already creeping up the man's face, you knew it was the first kind of uneasiness settling into his body. The woman, more used to your presence by now, simply grinned in amusement as you approached. You flashed them both your warmest smile and reached wordlessly for a map of the museum. You shamelessly looked the young man up and down, assessing his trim figure and neatly pressed jacket before giving him a wink. You heard him sputter in surprised delight as you turned on your heel and walked further into the museum. You didn't need the map. You hadn't needed one in a very long time, so you tossed it carelessly into the recycling bin at the end of the hall. You wound your way back in time through stone hallways and neon signs, past heavy oil paintings and gold leaf manuscripts delicate glassware and carved statues, all the way until you reached a singular archway leading into a square, dimly lit room labeled Mesopotamian Antiquities. You walked into the room slowly, reverently, as though the bits and baubles on display were the gods themselves sitting in the room. 
but you knew them for what they really were. Memories. Each item had been carefully excavated, catalogued, and displayed here in the museum. Delicate bulbs allowed you enough light to see by, but not so much as to damage the pieces. To most museum-goers, these items represented the past, but to you they were so much more. You lived among these items once. Each precious piece that existed here had once been no more than an everyday object to you. The squat, painted ceremonial jar was not some sacred item as described on the label, but merely the jug in which citizens had kept their water. Beautiful, yes, but sacred? Hardly. The heavily beaded necklace that had once been laid out and offering to you sat in a glass cage. The true story behind that necklace was one the museum curators did not know, but would love to hear. It was the story of a young woman who stole the necklace from your altar to impress another, who quaked with fear when you appeared before her in your magnificent glory, and who wrote hymns about you when you spared her life. That was the real story behind the necklace. You could tell the whole world the real story, but you found it much more fun to keep silent. Besides, those memories were a warm blanket on a cold day, a comforting reminder of what had once been. You didn't mind that things were different now. In fact, you welcomed it. Your children and your children's children ruled the skies, the seas, the earth, and all that existed beyond, and you were grateful for it. A star can only shine so brightly before it burns out, and you were proud of your gentle fading, of your soft descent from the heavens into a more comfortable life. Let the children hunt for their glory. You'd ruled for thousands of years, and still thousands of years after that they were saying your name. Let the others try to achieve half of what you accomplished in your time. A smile crossed your lips as you passed in front of a statue titled Inanna in Stone. You were depicted there with large breasts on display and hips nearly as wide as your shoulders that curved into finely shaped legs. But it was the statue next to this one, one that was neither man nor woman, yet somehow both at the same time. This was the statue that always caught your attention the most. It was titled Inanna in Marble, and it was your favorite piece in the museum. Your hand traced across the glass in a gentle lover's caress. It wasn't lost on you, even after all these years, how strange it was to see these items reverently on display. To know that what had once been mundane was now so carefully protected to see the life you once led decorate the rooms of a museum. That was the gift of eternity, to see today become history and to watch the cycle trip over itself time and time again. As you left the museum, you gave the freckled young man and the dark-haired woman at the desk your phone number. You knew that without a doubt there would be messages waiting for you before you even made it home. I love, love that you put this in second person. Thank you. I wish I could tell you what inspired me to do it, but I don't remember. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> because if I were in that museum and that woman came and talked to me, I would like to feel that I would know I was in the presence of a goddess. Mm -hmm. It just hits so right. And you and I explore second person sometimes, and we talk about it a lot off the show, that sometimes second person, it's it feels jarring, and sometimes that's great. Sometimes mm -hmm. you want it to feel jarring. But this just felt like a, mm, like a little art gender feminist hug <laughs> this was really fun to do i mean for all those reasons and i intentionally did uh something in the story which if you really pay attention i don't gender inanna uh and that was part of i think that was part of why i had fun writing it in second person but so you know, your shoes make a clack 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 sound not your heels 
you know, it could be dress shoes for men. It could be mm-hmm. heels for women. It could be a woman wearing men's dress shoes. You know, I, I wanted every listener to have the opportunity to know what it felt like to be this godly creature of love and war reflecting on their lives. And I think you doing that is part of what made it feel like I'm just it's such an embrace. Like getting to be in that persona and feel that power. And then also that story is filled with so much love and tenderness. Mm-hmm. This is a, a goddess, and I use goddess because that's typically yeah. how Anana is described. This goddess has a reverence for humanity in the way that humans have a reverence for Anana. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you did it, but in being in that story, I get to experience divinity and I'm also imagining myself if I could witness it, if I could meet her. And that is such a double think game. (laughs) I love it. Thank you. It was, it was, uh, I loved writing this one. I want to like write this over and over and over again because I wanted to explore exactly what you said, the idea of divinity and having a love for for what that means. But also I really wanted to explore the idea of aging gracefully and aging and accepting what it means to age and not look back and think about how desperate you are for more time, but how grateful you are for what you've had and how beautiful it was to have it. You and I and a lot of our femme friends put a lot of work into appreciating aging because it takes an active effort in this society where people are trying to sell you things. Mm -hmm. So as a listener to this story, I really appreciate that because aging is a delight. It's It's a gift. It is something we should be grateful for. And it breaks my heart constantly. I, I think about it all the time that our society is so afraid of it and so afraid of what it means to be older. And, and especially, again, as a woman, I think about losing my value as I age. Mm-hmm. And I hate that because I'm only getting smarter and I'm only getting better and I'm only learning to be a better version of myself. And why should crow's feet make that irrelevant? Exactly. It, it's ridiculous. And and so I try to embody the love and respect for the idea that I aging and actually one of our um, listeners um, in our discord, people say like happy level up day. And they're like, I'm X level years, old. you know, I'm whatever level years old. And I love that idea. Because mm-hmm. to me, you're just gaining levels, you're getting better. You're not, that's not a number to be scared of. You want more levels. And I think about the women in my life, And so many of the women I'm closest to and who I admire the most are older than me. Mm -hmm. And I think my grandma, who is one of the most important people that has been in my life, if she didn't get to age, I wouldn't have had time with her. And yes, just to imagine. Also, I mean, it gets tied into the fact that I was catcalled and harassed by men more when I was a preteen and a teen than now. And I am older and more equipped to handle it and don't Mm -hmm. look like prey. Yes. And that is foul. It's disgusting. We, oh God, we don't have time to dive into that, but I'm sure we'll do an episode on, (laughs) to touch on that topic, the idea that men date young women because they seem like prey, because they're not going to fight back because they don't know any better. Oh yeah. Now, now I know what I want and I know how to ask for it, Mm -hmm. which makes me less easy to manipulate. Yes. I will add, as a last detail, you we talked about this in the episode, but you did that amazingly cool thing of like, these are just normal items and now they're in a museum because they don't know better. And you saw an exhibit, right? That- yes. I wish I could tell you where it was. I think it was in Sweden. It might have been at, at one of the museums I went to in Sweden where it was a bunch of um, different toothbrushes, like different yeah. styles and varieties of <laughs> toothbrushes um, hung up the way that you hang up items in a museum. And then there was another section that was hairbrushes. And it was all different types and styles of hairbrushes and combs. And for me, it was so jarring to see something that sits on my bathroom counter out of context. And it made me realize how that would feel in 1,000 years to go look at and be like, this is 
you're not understanding the picture of what this is. Like that toothbrush hanging in a display case doesn't feel like the toothbrush I know because the toothbrush, uh, the toothbrush that I know is in a toothbrush holder on my bathroom counter under the lighting in my bathroom. And I see it mm-hmm. every single morning surrounded by hair ties and <laughs> Q-tips. And, and, you know, it's it's so different. And so that combined with the idea that um, in, in archaeology, very often when people aren't entirely sure how to classify something, they'll classify it as um, a religious object or Ooh. more specifically a ritual object. Because rituals can mean so many things. Brushing your teeth is a ritual. Oh, that makes sense. You could say a toothbrush is a ritual object. And so it gives you a little bit of wiggle room when you're trying to understand what it means. And those two concepts were what made me really want to write the story the way I did and have someone go back and say, yes, you're seeing what I saw, but you don't understand what you're seeing. That also circles us back to this idea of what is personally sacred. I think of... I have this antique hand mirror that I really love. Mm -hmm. And if that were in a museum, I love it. But is it sacred? Eh, Probably not. But at the same time, if I am so far in the past that the person who is viewing that is able to romanticize me Mm -hmm. as this woman who, maybe not unlike them, held this hand mirror and gazed at her reflection and blah, 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 blah. Now, all of the sudden, both... I and that hand mirror are closer to the divine. It's that, like, the feeling of being in the shoes of Inanna. You are elevated yeah. by the people that are witnessing you. Mm-hmm. That's a really good point. You did so well with that story. Thank you. So now we're jumping closer to the present. Episode 71, I covered Achilles and Patroclus. Yes, this was such a good one. The way that I love these two boys who were just roommates. No. <laughs> They're just roommates. I loved that episode because, A, the Greeks were super gay. Uh, you can oh, yeah. get into, if they had a term for it, all of the details. Honestly, listen to the episode. But the men were having sex with the men. So we don't have to do the roommates thing, but I'm also so interested in this story viewing these two men as just two people who care about each other so deeply. Mm -hmm. And do you have to think about the sexual element to value how close they are? I love that they're a couple, so I am perfectly content, but I do think it allows us to examine how men are able to be close with one another today. Right. Men men aren't given the same grace in that emotional intimacy. And that's part of what I love in this story is getting to explore that. All right. There is a poetry of war that is not like this. It tells of heroism like a sacrifice that bears the weight of only one page. Hunger like desire, wounds open like wanting, a joy in victory, and never the verse that describes defeat. The men of war are depicted as gods, able in every way. There is no task too great, no blade too sharp, no foe too fast. Our enemy can never be so brave or so strong as our own legends can metamorphose our men. I thought I might be taller by now. There might be an inner strength that comes from killing for my homeland, that first wash of blood and bile anointing me with the favor of Athena. The Trojans would look upon me and quiver, for my gaze would contain the very fire of the gods, I would spear men like fish, perhaps two or three in a moment, and somehow the throngs of armored enemies would split before me, swallowed in the fervor and power of our army. I am no fool, mind you. I am young and so unversed in the experience of war. I know my stature and my strength as surely as I know the sound of the waves on our ships. For all my youth 
and trembling, I can see that my only advantage is that my bones do not tire as easily as the men who are older and cleverer than I. My life before the war was short. So little had come of me. There is no learning, and growing there is only babe at the breast safe at home, and me, man of war, transported in a blink and terrified. I cannot remember my sister's smile, or the way that the path turns from my favorite swimming hole. There is a bread I can no longer name that wafts through my dreaming, and I wonder if my old and tattered sandals still sit by my mother's old loom. But I know how to fish a bird from the air. I've swum in the wine-dark ocean. My hair still grows and is cut and grows again. All the people who have ever known me may be dead. Or they've forgotten. I look upon the vast swath of muck where I toil, and I realize that there is a smile five years old that I cannot even render any longer. I've never shown anyone the way I can ride a horse or the funny trick I could do to make my mother laugh by using a slip of grass to crow from out in the field. And that is all. There is nothing else to me that I would know myself from the next dying man bleeding out at my feet. I am a Myrmidon. I fight alongside Achilles, golden god among men. I've had Patroclus clean my wound, and I've bested them both with dice, <laughs> only once. And I can imitate the way they laugh and carry on the way they communicate in familiar jokes. Half a dozen men all crowd around the fire with them so closely pressed and known that they could share another man's stories and, and never have a breath out of place. There is no force stronger than ours. We are the best trained and the best led. We are respected through the camp and I am promised a shared glory every morning. As long as you are remembered, you are never gone. As long as one man alive can speak your name, you exist, and there is no glory but to be known. I will memorize every Myrmidon's name. I am nearly there. I remember the cracks in Timon's eyes when he laughed. I recall Hesperos by his missing hand. I remember Leontios and his beautiful wife Melita, who he called out to when he drank, Erastus, who was quiet and kind, and Clytus, who couldn't swim. With my own hands, I will cover them each with earth, and I will try to recall every detail that kept them separate from the sword-swinging pack of us. And that is only the men from this morning— I have seen Achilles weep into the arms of Patroclus as they stood by the sea at night. Perhaps, if I am killed before I am known, I will grab the Trojan by his neck, my hands slick with blood, his spear within my belly, and I will say, Diocles, like a curse that he will whisper my name each night in horror. That is not knowing a man, nor is it forgetting him. This story is so beautifully poetic. And obviously it's not a poem, but it, it gave me the same feeling as those epic poems hmm. in the way that it was written. And the line, our enemy can never be as brave and strong as our legends metamorphose our men. I literally wrote it down <laughs> when I was listening to the story because I was like, that is one of the most beautiful sentences. It's thank you, incredible. Thank you. I really wanted to include this story in this compilation of queer stories because 
it is not told from the perspective of Achilles or Patroclus or even really focusing on them. Mm -hmm. And I want to highlight that, like, being queer is just a thing that you are. It's not the only thing that you are. Yes. And these two men were in at war for their entire like a massive chunk of their adult lives achilles his entire adult life Mm -hmm. it just decades lifetimes worth of men gone in this story at war Mm -hmm. and so whether or not you are queer or a soldier looking up to other men there is an innate humanity there and i like that this young soldier has a moment of appreciating these two older, more powerful soldiers from a very masculine lens because so often people who are homophobic try to make it seem like gay men are less masculine. Yes. <sighs> yes. <laughs> it, which is ridiculous. It's – I love that you, you said that, that, you know – being queer is just a part of a larger picture of a person. And so much in media, we love to be like, see, they threw in a gay person and their whole personality is like, and the, the joke of like, everyone move, I'm gay. Like, yes. There's a, the sketch of that. Like it's <sighs> deeply frustrating because it just doesn't have to be so loud. But at the same time, I understand why people might be loud about it when you feel like you've spent your entire life not being heard. Oh, well, that's the thing, right? Ideally, we have it all. We have all Mm -hmm. the spectrums, and you can be wherever you want on that spectrum. I do believe that it is our responsibility as people who write and make media to also just have people who happen to be queer. Yes. And from the perspective of this character... They just happened to be gay, but really, they were all just a bunch of soldiers, and he was like, I would love not to die. The way you described how he thought war would be in an idealistic sense versus the shock of reality was so good. Thank you. Yeah, he's just, he was, you start the story off with someone who understands how naive he used to be after everything he's seen and describes how he got to where he is. Yeah, it's... Do you have those moments where you realize how naive you used to be and you reflect on it just as it's too late? All the time. It's... it's. He has that moment of like, oh, I was a fool and now I am... This is where I remain. Mm Mm-hmm. And to know that you are not the hero of the story but an expendable resource for more powerful people... Mm-hmm. It's that thing of in America, everyone thinks they're just in temporarily embarrassed millionaires when really we're all workers. Yeah. For the most part, all meaning the majority of us. Yep. And it's really handy to divide people up by class because it separates mm-hmm. everyone. But to be a soldier and in this time, in this story, in this position, and know that you are just a a dot. Yeah. (sighs) It was great. Thank you. I loved getting to explore all four of these. It's fun writing stories with you and then talking about them. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's been good. It's nice. It truly, it is nice to force ourselves to go back and appreciate what we've done because I Mm -hmm. don't think either you or I would be inclined to do that. Uh, No, because it it feels um, self-indulgent to consume what you've created, to me at least. And also there's the the idea that um, it's either going to be self-indulgent or I'm going to nitpick all of it. And so no matter how I do it, it is vaguely uncomfortable, but it's also (laughs) a great learning opportunity. Yeah, it, it, it was just a great opportunity to learn about what I need to learn still and what I like and what you like. Um, Mm -hmm. But we've also been doing this for a minute now. The show has evolved. Yes, it definitely has. Um, And I'm I'm grateful that it has because I think change is always good. So Mm -hmm. without further ado, Tracy, Mm -hmm. tell me something good. All right. My something good this week is is something really simple. Um, 
I've just gotten really back into listening to Mika, you know, on theme with our, our queer episode. I'll highlight a queer artist Amazing. I love. <laughs> I even Rowan was a couple minutes late um, to recording and I was like, oh, my God, please take as much time as you need. I am jamming to Mika. And I've been for like this whole week. Like I, it was, He was on a playlist I randomly put on and I was like, oh, my God, I love him. Um, and when I was in Italy and it was it was late at night, we hadn't slept and I had to drive our car like four hours to our destination to our hotel it was really stressful because i was driving abroad Eek. for the first time ever um and casey was with me and so what she did was she put on all of my favorite mika songs and we sang at the top of our lungs to them to help me like stay calm while driving and so i remembered that and so there are a ton of moments in my life that uh his music has been on in the background and and every time i come back to it i find new things to love about it so mika is my Something good this week. Everyone I love go that. listen to him. He's amazing. I will probably be doing that after this because mm-hmm. I have a couple playlists with Mika. Compliments of you. Ah, yes, I love him. He's on most of my playlists. All right, Rowan, it's your turn. Tell me something good. Mine is also in the spirit of simplicity. It's raining outside. I love the rain. I love it. And rain in Los Angeles is a a stickier situation than it is in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. No one it, knows what to do with it, and it's kind of dangerous uh, for a lot of folks. And in my something good, I choose to just enjoy the sound. I have a lot of work to do, so I'm curling up with books and computer and tea mm-hmm. and living the dream I actually want, which is weather <laughs> and cloudiness and gloom. I am so happy for you that you get to experience that because it's been doing that a lot here lately and I'm getting tired of it. Yeah, you and I are really in the opposite place, but, you know. (laughs) It builds character. (laughs) (laughs) Do it for the plot. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember that stories grow with the telling. So if you like what we do, tell a friend. Or tell a foe. And we'll see you soon, okay? Thank you so much for joining us for the Willing and Fable podcast. This episode was written and produced by Tracy Harrison and Rowan Hall. That's me. Our logo is by Jamie Harrison, and our music is by Taylor Ash. If you ever want to watch or read what we're reading, head over to willingandfable.com for our show notes and custom merch, or find us at Willing and Fable on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok to join the discussion. We hope you'll rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast using your favorite listening source. And check out Willing and Fable on Patreon, where we have more than a few surprises for you, including custom artwork, stories, and access to our secret Discord channel. And of course, join us next time for another round of original retellings and in-depth research on the history, mystery, and mythology that makes the world so fascinating. You, that was not subtle. You were like, <laughs> I was doing that thing where you like eat don't your own. Suspicious, <laughs> but you were like making. Were like, you like suck your own face? lips into your mouth? You're just like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs>